How to spot a fake Rolex. This is a question we get asked often. Today, we're gonna make you look like the expert. We got our man Peter over here to answer some questions for us. Let's get right into the topic of fake Rolexes. We get them, you know, or I guess we don't get them that often, or at least we, we try not to. Of course. But we do get asked often, you know, how do you spot one? What do you look for? Um, before we get into some of the details that, you know, I have, tell me what is your go-to, I guess, thing or i mean handling so many rolexes over the years it's literally become second nature right the way the way it feels how sharp the angles are how the crystal looks i mean there's so many telltale signs there isn't just one thing that i look at but that's the crystal would be the biggest thing right off the bat the crystal crystal why what, what is it about the crystal it's usually the cyclops right so i could automatically tell just by the color of the gasket no matter what rolex it always overhangs a little bit mm -hmm. i can tell you right off the bat if it's an original crystal or if it's aftermarket but the biggest thing is the cyclops yeah right? i, I want to get into that i have like the actual specifics obviously the general you know tips for anybody trying to spot a fake rolex is first of all documentation you know you want to make sure that you have full documentation. I mean, a wa if a watch is less than two years old, why would it be missing a card? Why would it be missing a box or any or papers or anything like that? Is there any reason that you could think of so, other than somebody losing it? So someone, yeah, definitely, it could definitely be lost. However, I've been hearing tons of stories of ADs actually holding back cards, right? Because they don't want someone to resell their watch. Yeah. So they're actually taking the warranty cards and holding it on file. And How you, long do you think they do that for? I would say it has to be a period of a, a year at most. Okay. So you're assuming somebody bought it directly from an AD and they're reselling it without the card. Um, as far as dealer to dealer, I'm sure they're going to mention that. Like, you know, the card is being held by the AD. I'll have it to you as soon as it's released. Yep. As far as selling it to a retail client, how do they pass that message along? There's no way to navigate that situation. doesn't matter if it's brand new, fresh out of the store. Without that card, you physically can't. Tell. How comfortable are you buying a watch that is so-called naked? No, no papers? All day long. I buy them all day long. Okay. That's Perfectly because you are an expert and you could tell right away from the watch yeah. itself. A lot of times you also don't have to pay for the watch before you, you see it. Correct. But as an end user, as a consumer, you don't have those options. You're buying it from seeing it on eBay, from seeing it on Chrono24, from mm -hmm. seeing it on LuxuryBazaar.com. And you're like, how do I know that this is real? This watch has no papers. Correct. Even like Facebook Marketplace, it's a very big thing. Even on our, uh, in our group, someone actually posted yesterday, they were buying a watch secondhand off of Marketplace. This is very scary, especially yeah. with no documentation. If you don't know, you know how to navigate the situation or if you don't have a store to do it for you, it's a very scary situation. You can lose a ton of money very quickly. So let's assume just for the sake of argument here, if a watch has no documentation, no, no paperwork, no card, let's take filter that one out. I'm not buying that one. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to buy one that comes with papers because at least I have a little bit more confidence that it's authentic. The second, you know, again, this is a very general tip is obviously buy from a trusted and a credible dealer. Of course. You know, whether you're buying it from an AD, whether you're buying it from Luxury Bazaar, whether you're buying it from Corona 24, you have to know who you're dealing with. I Absolutely. Mean, how do you, I mean, have you ever purchased a watch from somebody that you've never done business with before? Uh, yeah, tons of times, actually. Um, you know, from regular people, you know, I send mm -hmm. them a label and the watch comes in. Um, I mean, it's pretty common nowadays, I would say more or less for dealers. However, if it's just your regular person coming off the street buying a watch from someone in another state, I would say that's where it gets scary. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely accredited sources. Yeah, I think buying right. it from individuals is a lot scarier than buying it from an established business. I mean, Absolutely. you can research a business, how long they've been in business, who they are, where they're located. You Correct. can stop by their location and talk to them. So you want to make sure that when you're buying a Rolex that you are you know who you're buying it from rather than mm -hmm. just some, you know, eBay user, one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. I have no idea if he's in his mother's basement, if, you know, this is a, a real watch or not. Um, as far as, you know, the most commonly counterfeited, you know, Rolex models, my research and the research that our, our writers have done shows that they are the most common watches just because it's so liquid. I mean, you're gonna do, you know, Submariners, GMTs, Daytonas, um, Datejust, these are just, you could sell them easily. You're not, you know, you're not doing anything crazy. You're not doing a rainbow Daytona, yeah, which, yeah. you know, requires <laughs> you a lot more money and, and, you know, people would really research that. Um, however, very old, you know, Rolexes, are very likely not counterfeit. It's unlikely Correct. that somebody will, you know, counterfeit a... 1980s Datejust. Correct. It, it doesn't make sense. 
Yeah, yeah, I get it. Have you ever seen any of like the the clones, super clones, yes. counterfeit ones that are atypical? That are not one of these. So, okay, so I get messages from dealers all day long. Mm -hmm. I've built up quite a repertoire, at least with you know a major dealer network, that they actually send me pictures, and I have tons of proof of this. They'll send me pictures before they're buying something. The client could be in the store and they will literally reach out to me, say, hey, could you take a look at this quick? I'm talking dealers that have a very large name, can't name anybody, of course. but there's some fakes that will actually accept genuine parts, right? They call them the Frankensteins. Yep. That's where it just, I mean, the whole ball game is over. If you don't catch that, you're how, done for it. How do you catch that? Like, so there's Frankensteins and there's super Frankensteins, Correct. which actually use legitimate Rolex <laughs> parts. Crazy. If you open one up, would you have to take every single part? No, actually, in one of the gray market episodes, we got in a, uh, was it a 16233? Mm -hmm. yeah. It turned out to be a 1990 day just. All that it had was a fake movement, but it had a genuine dial, genuine hands, genuine crystal. Everything else was genuine. How did I, I was able to spot it literally by opening up the back, take a few looks at the movement. You could just tell the finishes. They're not there. I got you. So have you ever seen one where I, here's the thing, though, if everything is so perfect, what would differentiate it from an authentic one? They're using legitimate Rolex parts. Yeah. Something in there is clearly cheaper because, yes. you know, that's that's where they're making the money. Um, so, I mean, let's just say you get the one where you could put genuine movement parts mm -hmm. onto it. There's going to be, you know, some lack of quality control in the actual main plate and some of the bridges, the tolerances, the jewels that are used. Yeah, it's just not going to run the same. I wonder if there's an opportunity, and again, I'm not trying to create counterfeit watches, but like authentic movement, aftermarket band, aftermarket case. All day long they do oh, it. Oh, really? Okay. APs. Anything bust down, padded, yeah, APs, those, yeah. that's, sometimes yeah. they use genuine movements. Otherwise, it's all aftermarket. Um, I've seen a lot of like bust down Nautiluses, yes. that when they, but they actually say that the band and the case is aftermarket. The movement is legitimate, you know, but it doesn't mean that it's the legitimate one from the Nautilus. Yeah. You know, it could be Caltrava. Uh, Caltrava. Yeah, it yeah. could be a much cheaper movement, but it works. Yeah. So they say it's a paddock movement. Um, talking about the movement, so our research shows that a really good place to start is just taking a look at how the watch is moving. And I'm talking about staring at the dial, staring at the second hand. Um, Research, or I guess, I mean, our researchers have proven that the second hands should be moving between five to six or five to eight times every second. So although it looks like a sweeping hand, mm -hmm. and, you know, Ian, if you could throw that image up, it doesn't actually sweep. Correct. So it ticks. Correct. So we actually, with that probe lens, we actually have video of how the seconds wheel actually works. So the other train wheels, which is, you know, the gear train that basically makes the second hand spin around. It's catching every other tooth, right? So it's physically impossible for it to sweep around mm -hmm. in a flawless motion. Yeah. It's definitely ticking in between. That that's just a very bad way to try and you know differentiate a fake. I think. I think Is it a very, bad way? Why? I think it's a very bad way. I mean, you, you if, if I have it as a starting point. If you've seen a Rolex, right? If you've never seen a Rolex, right? And you're picking one up and you're looking at the hand. How are you going to be able to tell exactly oh. what a real one is ticking like? You know what, I guess the easiest way is like, is this ticking or is it's it sweeping? Cor correct, yeah, yeah. So, so there's no way that. that I could tell that this is moving, you know, five to eight times per second. Exactly. I mean, so some of the older ones, you know, are moving slower. Some of the newer ones correct. are moving about eight times per second. Um, the second, you know, tell that our experts have, you know, come up with is the Cyclops. So a yep. Rolex Cyclops should, you know, be 2.5, you know, yes. magnification. Um, and any time it does not properly fill the window, you know, the date does not properly fill the window, it's questionable, whether it's like awkward, whether it's like tilted, uh, the yep. font might be weird, or if it just looks too small, too big, like something is like exactly. weird there. Ian, if you could throw up that picture of what, so we have a picture of two fake um, Rolexes with the Cyclops, and mm -hmm. then we have one with a, a, an authentic, a real one, with the way the date, the date wheel f fills that window. Um, obviously a lack of magnification would be, you know, a tell or just if something looks off there, if, you know, it doesn't fit, I guess that's probably the best way to, to discuss it. Absolutely. Um, case back markings. So this is, this is a very big thing, right? So the case back engravings, they're usually engraved by CNC machine, right? It's 
it's a pretty much a program you could identically copy the fonts um and you won't be able to see these case back engravings right unless you actually own the physical tool to take the case back off i'm talking about the outside what do you mean by the outside i mean the back of the back of the watch itself you know Okay. With very few exceptions, they have absolutely no, no markings. Engravings. Correct. You know, so I know that uh, a sea dweller and oh, okay, you mean on the outer rim? Yeah. Okay, okay, of the actual case. Yeah, back. I mean, I'm yes. talking about like the actual back of the watch. Got you. Okay. So sea there are like Rolgaus. very, you know, very few models. Obviously, there's mm -hmm. some older Rolexes that have some, not including anybody that has done it custom for themselves. So you know, mm -hmm. you have Dominoes, you have like you know some other yeah, guys yeah. that that have done this or have commissioned it to be complete. Um, but typically, no logos, no information, completely blank. Zero. Have you ever seen something, you know, that changed that whole view? Um, no. So even if you do engrave your watch, I mean, oh. it's still kind of tough. So You could tell by our, the shape, I guess you could say, maybe. But that's maybe. getting very technical. According to our research, there are a few ladies' models that had stainless steel, you know, on mm -hmm. the back, you know, on a, on a case back. Correct. Older stainless uh, steel. Yes, yep. all, older ones. With so many variations, how do you know? So, uh, yes, clearly, if you're buying a modern-day Rolex, you look at the back. If it has a Rolex logo on it, it's fake. We actually have a fake ladies 26 right over there. Really? Yeah. Natalie found it in a basket and gave it to me, and I said, within two seconds, Who, made it? Who makes a 26-millimeter fake? fake? But it actually has that engraving on it. That's exactly what, stainless steel? Or? Stainless steel. Wow. And it's completely, I mean, it's completely incorrect how they do it. They add in a bunch of different stuff. But, yeah, that, they, that's exactly what they used to do on some of the older clones. Yeah. Very interesting. Clearly, you're never going to see a Rolex with a see-through see case back. You're never right. going to, you know, that's never going to happen, yeah. or at least it hasn't happened yet. Um, if you see one of those run, that's definitely not the case. The case back stickers is a completely different story. That's another great tell, right? Because the fake ones usually have these horrible hor uh, Hologram. holographic, holographic yeah. stickers. Yeah. That are the completely wrong color. They're the completely wrong font. 90% of the times, the, the bad fakes that I see with those stickers, they reference another model that's not even the watch that it's on. I've seen some of you those. Know you know, yeah. They're, they're, first of all, they're horrible. I mean, Rolex stopped putting you know, stickers on watches in, um, I don't know, 2006. I was going to say, yeah. yeah. The, 2006, yep. they stopped putting on stickers. They used to put on stickers to counter counterfeiters. Counterfeiters haven't stopped putting on <laughs> stickers. I think that it does make the watch look a little bit more authentic, the fact that there is like a green sticker. So I have a, a picture that, um, Ian, if you could throw that up. These are actually all real. Every one of these stickers Correct. is a sticker that Rolex has used in the past, from a completely plain green one to holographic you know, logos and, and numbers and all sorts of stuff. And, Clearly, none of these worked because they're still, you know, counterfeited still constantly. Um, let's move on to a little bit more detail. So the engraved rehot, rehot. That yeah. So that's the engraving that's on the inner bezel, right? That'll house your serial number and and then the um, Rolex, Rolex, Rolex insignia all the way around. Correct. If you ever see, you know, any gaps or if it's missing serial number, it's missing, you know, the the Rolex. I'm assuming that's like a clear tell that something, I'm assuming, again, on a modern Rolex, not mm -hmm. on any vintage or new vintage models. Um, serial numbers at six o'clock, Rolex, Rolex, Rolex goes all the way around. Yes. And then the crown should be directly at 12 Directly at 12. Are there models that are, let's say, take this GMT Master, for example, mm -hmm. let's say one from eight years ago, would it still be the same? No. So the older reference number would be 116710, mm -hmm. right? The, the first ones that were issued, they automatically had engraved rohats, Okay. right? So that they automatically came with that. For going back to the five-digit models, not one of them had engraved rehot. So the, the serial number would actually be at six o'clock in between the lugs. Yeah. Right on the case. So that's how they used to do them. They used to do the serial number and the reference number. Correct. Um, now, serial numbers was between the bottom lugs, mm -hmm. reference number, you know, those... A good, I guess, tell, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this before, you've taken off the band and the serial number engraving is just garbage, it's, you know. I've seen it all. But it's funny, because I've seen some older ones where, you know, you're looking at it, you're like, this is horrible. Yes. You know? But they're, they're real watches. It's real, yeah. Because I, I want to say that they were actually hand engraved at one point, maybe on super older models, I, don't quote me on this, but I've seen some of the worst engravings, like in terms of numbers and literature, 
like ever. Like it looks like they scratched it in there with a nail. And it's real. It's you don't real. think they take any like beating from the, the band or like they the, do. The, they do. That's they do. why it always looks like it looks abused. Correct. It's usually marred. Mm -hmm. Like so the metal on metal contact over, let's say, a course of 30 years, yeah. it's going to mar the serial number. It's going to, you know, discolor it. And some of it will actually fade away. I got you. Okay, so it could still be authentic, but it looks like that. So it's not Correct. the first thing to do is not to be like, oh, this is fake. It's a 30 year old yep. watch. I mean, it's taken some abuse. Yep. Um, dial stampings. How do you tell? So, for example, Daytona, um, what is it, the APH? Correct. How is that? Like, how did somebody not look at me like, oh, this is fake? I see a gap between. <laughs> you see the you see the letters touching, right? So usually Rolex is pretty. They're pretty Meticulous. sterile. I mean, they're, yeah, they're very sterile in terms of everything from the finishes, the case, everything. They really are. There have been times where, you know, literature like that has gotten out into the real world. Just makes things more collectible. But when you want to get into the actual stampings on the dial, like I'm talking literature, colors, fonts, that's a completely different ballgame. It gets very, very technical, right? Like how the R is shaped. Mm -hmm. Um, it really comes with experience. It really does. I've seen a, an image before of the Rolex like fonts change over the years. Correct. I have no idea how anybody would be able to keep track of like what it's supposed to look like, what it's not supposed to look like. The mm -hmm. only thing that you know I know and that our research has shown is that first of all, it should be perfect. Now again, the APH model, and if, for those that don't know, there was a uh, a Rolex. Daytona that came out yep. where the word cosmograph, there was too big of a space between the cosmograph, uh, the APH. R and the A, yeah. and then the APH were like closer, like they it was, was yeah, they were gaps. Yeah. Almost kissing the two letters. It yeah. was only found in 116520 models. How, do you, any idea how many of those they made? That's and like, why would they tough. continue making the mistake? So I, I want to say that they were only really put out with the watches from like 2011 to 2014, technically. Mm -hmm. Let's just say there's probably 30, 40,000 plus of them but, out okay, there. Okay, Rolex being the, the, the brand that they are and how meticulous they are. Oh, we fucked up. Cool. Let's keep doing it. So, you know, so here's actually the craziest thing. Um, when you make a dial, you need to have what's called um, for the stamping of the actual dial. It's mm -hmm. like an imprint or a block. And it has the literature perfectly oh, done it's, on it's, it. They're not cheap. Yeah, it's engraved on it's, there. Anyway. Correct. Yeah, it's yeah. an ink pad. You stamp it and then bring it over. It's not cheap. So yeah. maybe, I doubt it was a money issue, but maybe yeah. they were just like, let's let it slide. They didn't change it. So maybe, I mean, do you think it took that long to catch? No, there's no way. Somebody would have caught it. So this was just them like specifically making an air dial that they knew was going to be collectible. I think that could be. But ultimately, I mean, with the dial stampings, you want to, first of all, make sure spelling is there. Of course. You want it to be completely crisp and clean. If you see any smudging, if you see any, like, weird imprints, mm -hmm. it's right away, you know, an, a, a tell that it could potentially be fake. Um, we have seen some, some misspellings. We have seen stampings that are missing letters. Yep. Um, I kind of feel like it's raised. If you really zoom in, and Ian, if you could pull up that yes, picture, it is. it is raised, you know, ink. You Correct. can't, I can't really see it here, but if I was to zoom in, you know, with a loop, for example, mm -hmm. I'd probably see it. It's not raised enough to the point where if you ran your fingernail over it, you could actually feel yeah. it. Um, having actually worked with dials and even rubbed off the lettering on accident before by dropping oil on wow. it, it comes right off. It's, it's not raised by, you know, it's not raised fully, but it's definitely raised a little bit. Okay. Next one that um, comes up is the laser etched coronet. So, <laughs> the little. Oh, oh it's six o'clock. Yes, okay. that's the name of I it. I call it, yeah, it's, okay. It's called the laser etched coronet. Okay. Um, it's the tiny little crown that Rolex, in 2002, they started, you know, I guess it, it's laser etching this little crown on the bottom, which you can't see. Like, you cannot see it unless you turn the watch in a you certain angle. You have to catch it in the right light. And you look at it like I'm seeing it now, but it, it's not yep. clear. It looks like a smudge. It looks like something I could take off. It doesn't come off, obviously. Um, counterfeiters have obviously begun doing those as mm -hmm. well. The one tip that a lot of our research has shown is that counterfeiters try to overdo it where they make it you know, visible. Correct. If you could easily see it, that is definitely a tell that it's potentially a counterfeit watch. Um, it... In a photo on eBay or on Chrono, you should not be able to see it unless you no. magnify the, the image significantly. 
And even then, you probably still shouldn't yeah, see it. Because if you take a picture of your watch yeah, head you can't, on, you're you can't not see seeing it. it. No. There's so, no like if I were just to take a picture like this, there's no way I could see it. You need a loop to see the LEC, which is the yeah. lower engraved crown. Yeah. There's no way. Um, weight and material. Now, obviously, you can't say, oh, this is exactly a certain number of grams. You know? No. However, newer model Rolexes are solid links. They mm -hmm. are made of quality materials. They're going to be heavier than what you know, what you would assume a fake would be. Correct. So Rolex, their steel um, is 904L steel, right? It's their quote unquote, their generated in house yeah. steel. The fakes actually have 904L steel now. I don't think, it, did no one know this? I have no idea. Yeah, so fakes actually have 904L steel. It's not. Three, Isn't that a proprietary Rolex method uh, to create? Correct, but there's there's ways and there's formulas. Think about it. If they could fake, they could fake anything at this point, right? So 316 steel, even when you polish it to a high polish, it doesn't have the same luster yeah. and same sheen as 904L. So when you throw that in the mix, and then the quality of these factories, 3D scanning, I, I mean, it gets very very scary. It really does. They're using the same materials. I mean, it almost, you know, they're almost making Rolex watches. They're almost making Rolex watches. That's um, the scariest point. I wonder how they, can, how they do that and still charge so much less than Rolex because they don't have the overhead, they don't have the marketing expense. It's insane, though. It really is. I, I would say the movement, but even, even at that point, the movements are so close and identical. Like, I mean, the only reason to actually own a, an authentic Rolex is the pride of ownership. You know that you bought the real product mm -hmm. at the real price overpriced whatever you did you know it's you're not wearing a, a fake item. exactly yeah um obviously the one you know i guess the, the the one type of rolex that wouldn't have that weight are older ones so older correct. subs older gmts that had the oyster bracelet they were hollow back then correct um they definitely felt a lot more hollow i mean even all the old day no, dates, they 100 percent they were like the old oysters and jubilees they're hollow you could see right through them Really? They, they felt like the head of the watch actually weighed more than the bracelet. So you would assume that they would be fake, but mm -hmm. that's not the case with those. Correct. So you just need to make sure that you're, you know, you know what you're looking at. Are you looking at an older style Rolex with a hollow bracelet or are you looking at a newer style Rolex? Um, as far as like a presidential Jubilee, um, was, was there a difference in weight between, because they're, they're obviously, so, you know, precious metals. Yeah, yeah. So everything precious metal, um, there was like a few different things, right? So the older style ones, like mm -hmm. the original ones that like um, Tony Soprano wore, yep. they had the semi-hollow links and then they went up to the, yeah, semi-hollow and then solid links. So the newest style, everything is solid and mm -hmm. then you have the heavy buckle. Yeah. Significantly different weight compared to like an older yellow gold one. Yeah. I, um, yeah. You, I mean, if you were to hold it in your hand, you could yeah. just tell if it's real gold, yeah. right? Just by the weight, the luster. So that, that would be the biggest thing for me. But. I mean, one of the things that, you know, when we're talking about day dates, I know that this has come up quite often is there aren't any two-tone day dates. There's, that's another great point, Avi, because I get tons of DMs <laughs> of two-tone day dates. I'm talking about like, like the most insane stuff I've ever seen, like Cosmograph with like an extra chrono and a date <laughs> on it. And that's like the biggest thing. It should be, if you're looking at a Rolex, I think you should go to Rolex website and just learn what the models yeah. actually are. What do they offer? That's a very How big do you do thing. that with an older model though? I guess you would just um, have to you could, Google the reference you would number. Reference number, yeah, you yeah. can go off that. But I would say the fake ones, the, uh, the older ones, they're not faked as as often as you'd think. It's funny, we got one today where a customer sent over an email saying, hey, I found this in my father's, you know, I know yeah, yeah. Josh asked you about that thing. I mean, that thing looked nothing like- Like a Rolex. I literally, Josh showed it to me, he showed me the phone and I literally took one look at it within two seconds. I was like, Rolex has never made anything like this. I am no expert, but I looked at it and I'm like, I can't believe this guy's even asking the question. Correct. Um, clearly he wasn't a, a watch guy. Yeah. Next one is the bezel. So, the bezel, although there isn't, you know, a scientific way to explain this, there's a certain feel to it. There, there actually is a scientific way, right? So the actual flutes of the bezel, I want to say when they're factory cut, it's almost at a 35 or 45 degree angle, something along that nature. Yours, yours is different. If we're talking about fluted is bezels, mine fake? No. 
<laughs> so if we're talking about a fluted bezel, I want to say it's roughly 45 degrees. That's the pitch, oh, Okay, you're talking right? about fluted bezels, fluted. Not, not GMTs or subs. or Correct. Know. So when you look at one of these, they often call it uh, the Reese's Pieces buttercup bezel. Right, okay. like yeah, the fake ones, because like, yeah. it's the fake ones. They're, they're super su thick. Yeah. They're super thick. It looks yeah. like a Reese's Pieces wrapper. That's a great way to tell. Um, but something like yours, there's actually what peaks and valleys, right? They go individually. Yeah. Same thing for a Submariner. It, it's it's so hard to tell unless you so, know what you're looking at. So yeah, the feel of the actual bezel, and then you go into the turning. The turning, mm -hmm. you know, as described, should be smooth with a yep. solid click. You know, you feel the quality and the strength, you know, behind the the the, the parts that make this happen. Um, I've seen fake, you know, subs and fake GMTs, and you're rolling around like it's no problem. Yeah, I mean, it's like, bleep, 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 you know, like. Yep. This, you can't even like, you can't turn it all the way around at once. Like it clicks every, you know, and it's a, it's a solid click, you know, like, um, I wonder why the, the fakers haven't been able to master this. Yeah. I think we got to get like one of these fakes in just to actually do a breakdown. Like I mean, some of the things that I see, it's just ridiculous. Can They're you using, describe a little bit like um, just how this whole spring loaded? You so, know. yeah, there's four holes. I, I believe it's four or three right on top of the actual mid case. Um, for the newer references, okay. for the newer Submariners, it's actually spring and ball bearing. So mm -hmm. there's actually a spring that goes into the receiving hole and then a ball bearing that goes on top along with the click spring and everything else in that mechanism. And that's what gives it the... Um, the clicking or almost ratcheting gotcha. feel as it's spinning around. The older ones, um, the older GMTs, they had it comprised of what? One, two, three, three or four parts. And it was actually a uh, click ring. Mm -hmm. Same thing for the oldest models, the Submariners. It literally had a bent piece of paper clip. I remember seeing that. Inside yeah. of it. So uh, it, it's changed. It's gotten stronger. It's gotten smoother. And it's gotten more reliable throughout the years. So... This is a, a uh, I guess, a more difficult tip, but this is a tip that I guess you should know where we make our listeners and viewers aware of. Knowing the reference number helps, you know, figure out what you're looking for. I mean, obviously, you, if, you ha if you know the reference, reference number, you can go on Google, you can search for images, you can search for, mm -hmm. you know, articles about this. Um, this is something that I guess typically people would know, but a sea dweller manufactured before 2017 would not have a Cyclops, whereas one after 2017 Whoa. has a Cyclops. Correct. You know, how do you, like, there's so many, like, little, little nuances. Yeah, how, how do you keep know. track of this crap? Like, I think the best would be, let me go search for images to see. That's, you know? that's you. The guy told me this is a 2021 Sea Dweller. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the reference number. I'm going to go search for a 2021 Sea Dweller. If the one that he's showing me has no Cyclops, something is wrong. Correct. Well, no, actually, because then you could always, it could always just be a, a new old stock watch that was dated later, right? So the reference number- Another you know, nuance, thank so you. So exactly, so if the watch is 2017, right? This was one of the last year, and this was made in 2017, but the ADs actually held on to it for a few years. Now they're selling it in 2020. It's gonna get that new date on it. The date on the card. Correct. But the manufacturer date. It would still have, that's why you need to know the reference numbers. Yeah. Cause it could say it's 2020, yeah. but it could actually be. You know, a 116 compared to a 126, you, you know, go. big difference there. Um, one of the things that kind of like threw me off is, and, and maybe you've seen this before. Have you ever seen a Rolex where it actually says made in USA on the bracelet? Yeah, so that's actually, um, they, there's also ones that say made in Mexico. <laughs> it's, you, again, Pencho in Mexico. You would assume off the bat this shit is fake. Yes. You know, and looking further into it, it's not. It's not. No. It's not. There was a time where importing, you know, those bracelets was so expensive. So expensive. That it just made sense to to have them made in in the USA. I, I think some of the older original Daytonas actually do have USA bracelets. It's USA, like almost in a triangle. Yep. Um, and then the Hencho in Mexico, there's there's tons of them out there. I would immediately assume that that's fake. It's like a Coca-Cola bottle. Yeah. Literally, it says Hencho in Mexico. That's amazing. That is that a collectible? No, it's just it's hmm. just like usually it's a 14 karat gold bracelet, and it was actually made there. Um, it, it's not that uncommon on the it's older funny, style like, of Jubilee. I remember when I was a kid, I had a um, a Volkswagen, and it was made in Mexico, and I was like. That's weird. <laughs> it's wild to think, right? <laughs> um, so our, you know, again, the, the, the research shows that from 1959 to about 79, you know, Rolex often used, you know, sourced bracelets. And yep. Mexico, U.S. does not mean immediately off the bat that this is fake. 
Correct. Is there anything else that you could think of that you would, you know, resort to to figure out whether a watch or a Rolex is real or fake, you know, without having to completely have all the, you know, the machines? Yeah. I was going to say how it's actually moving, like in terms of, like, whenever I pick up a watch, the first thing I always do is check how it's functioning, right? As far as, you know, How is it winding? Up. Is it winding smooth? Is it super crunchy? Is it skipping? Like, does it almost feel like it's not engaging? Whenever you pull the crown out, it should feel nice. You should have a nice, uh, Solid, strong yeah. click each way out. Yep. Um, but it, it, that, that might be tough for someone. Yeah. I would say just look at the engravings everywhere. Engravings are the biggest telltale sign, especially on the bracelet. I know it's you know I've it's never even be paid hard attention. for someone to do that, but you could just tell like when it's actually engraved how Rolex does it. I mean, yeah, it. it's definitely meticulous. It's yeah. definitely you know they they it's perfect. There's nothing. I'm not seeing anything that would be like oh you know that you know they should have fixed that. Correct. If you see it like if it almost looks white, right? Not yeah. not on yours because yours is real. So whenever you get one of these fakes, it'll the, it'll be laser engraved, and it leaves behind this white trail. It, it's another nuanced thing that you literally need to so deal with these watches to actually notice it. But it's like a white trail all the way through it. It's not engraved. You need to have it under some sort of magnification. Ultimately, obviously, you want right. to just trust who you're buying it from. Trust who you're buying it from. Buy from someone that's credible. Um, and better yet, they have a name on the line, right? That's one of the biggest things. Your reputation is everything. Would you trust any, like, would you just be able to walk into a watchmaker and be like, hey, can you look at this Rolex and tell me if it's real or not? I, honestly, over the last few years, I felt less and less confident with some watchmakers I know, specifically because those are the guys that are actually asking me yeah. now. If they're asking you, they that's kind of a problem. Not in itself. trustworthy to know. You know. Yeah. All right, Peter, I appreciate you taking the time to, to sit down with me and go over this. I hope that we we're helpful. I hope that uh, some of these tips will help some of you, you know, not make any mistakes. And, and if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to, to reach yeah, out reach to us. Out. I mean, we'll, we'll help anybody. It doesn't matter whether you're buying it from us or not. Um, if you like this episode, if you like our content, make sure to like, subscribe, write a review. Let us know what you want to see, what you want to hear, and show us love. We'll continue doing this every day. Guys, have a great day. Peter. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you.